This is a bit of a rant, I realize. It's not really advice. I don't think we're gonna call this a running the game video. So just take it in the spirit it is meant. It is me getting something off my chest. You are encouraged to disagree loudly. There's this phrase the designers use when describing fifth edition, which they also use to describe fourth edition, rulings, not rules. This is in response to the incredibly popular third edition of D&D, which was all about making sure there were detailed and consistent rules for everything. And it did that very well. I've got a whole series on the history of D&D. You can watch the third edition video here. The response to third edition was overwhelmingly positive. Having a robust, consistent system was a huge improvement over advanced Dungeons and Dragons, but eventually all of those rules were overwhelming. Someone watching a focus test at Wizards of the Coast described third edition as 30 minutes of fun packed into three hours. The other two and a half hours? Looking up or arguing about the rules. So every edition of D&D since then, 4th edition, 5th edition, has pulled back from that level of robust detail. The designers want to make sure there is a system, and it is consistent, but they don't want to create a rule for every possible situation. If there is a system, and it is consistent, then the DM can just sort of guess. If there were a rule for this unique situation, what would it be? And if the system is simple but robust and consistent, and the DM knows it well, their guess will make sense to the players. It will work for the moment. And that is way better than stopping everything and spending 20 minutes trying to find a rule in one of these books. That is the meaning behind rulings, not rules. Don't waste time looking it up, just guess. And if you're familiar with the rules, your guess might not be correct, but it will be good. Your players will think, that's fair, and you can move on. The ability to make a fair ruling on the fly that everyone at the table thinks is good is incredibly powerful because it keeps the game flowing. Everyone's still making forward progress instead of grinding everything to a halt just to look up a rule. Make a ruling so you can keep playing. Don't bother wasting time looking it up. Rulings, not rules. But I think there is a deeper truth here underlying this principle. It has to do with the purpose of rules. Why are there rules? Why not just make everything up? All of it, from scratch, every time you play. Why have rules at all? I think the answer is the rules of the game, whatever RPG you're playing, this isn't unique to D&D, give us a language with which to communicate. And it is that communication that's important. And if I'm right, then that's why people get so frisky about the rules. They do it for the exact same reason people get frisky about spelling and grammar, because they are actually the same thing. The problem with this, and I speak in my capacity both as a dungeon master and a professional writer, is that the people who hyper-focus on the correctness of the rules have a lot in common with the people who hyper-focus on the correctness of spelling and grammar. They are, almost without exception, joyless pedants. I speak here as someone who, throughout the entirety of 3rd edition's reign, was one of those joyless pedants. Playing by the rules, by a strict application of them, was of huge importance to me. We had a huge culture clash when a new DM joined our group and ran 3rd edition for us, and he had a troll do a sweeping attack with a log that hit all of us. How can the troll do that? We asked because we knew the rules. And we knew that the only way to do a sweeping attack like that was with a feat. And that feat required at least one level of fighter. And did this troll have a level of fighter? That would make it a custom monster. And we were pretty sure the DM hadn't thought that far ahead. Now, I would never in a million years object to something like that. Why can't a troll do that? Perfectly reasonable thing for a troll to do. But back then, we wanted to know that if we won or lost, and it is telling that I'm using terms from sports here, that it wasn't because the DM broke the rules, but it was in spite of the DM following the rules. And we were pretty sure he wasn't following the rules. Mind you, this was the whole point of third edition. I was being a joyless pedant, but I was also saying, hey, the whole reason we like these new rules is because of how robust they are. The fact that there was a rule for how can a troll swing a tree and hit everyone at once was a feature for us. 
It took a long time for me to realize that the problem wasn't our expectations or the DM failing to meet them. It was the fact that the design expected the DM to follow these incredibly Byzantine rules. I think I told this story, but years later, I made a bugbear chieftain in third edition and I spent literally six hours one Saturday calculating exactly which class levels and feats and prestige classes my bugbear needed in order to use his whip to grab your weapon, pull it toward him, snap it out of the air and attack with it. And the entire time I was thinking, if this dude dies in the first round of combat, I am giving up on D&D. He did not die in the first round of combat, FYI, he lasted seven rounds and it was epic. But the point is, I've had epic battles last seven rounds without spending six hours building a single villain. So why did I do all of that? Why did I invest like half my weekend on one bad guy for one encounter? Because I was more interested in following the rules than in the game. I was more interested in making sure my writing was grammatically correct than in creating something dramatic. Writers are not primarily interested in syntax and grammar. They are first interested in drama. We want to write things that move you, that excite you, that provoke thought or emotion, and these things have nothing to do with grammar or syntax. Oscar Wilde, and there are few writers in the English language who wrote with more felicity, would turn in his manuscript to his editor with a note reading, I trust you will correct all the woulds and shoulds, wills versus shalls, and that versus which. Shakespeare routinely ignored the rules and just invented. He invented new words and new phrases. He turned nouns into verbs. He was a master of the English language, but mastering it meant expressing himself with joy and invention. The master is not the one who obeys the rules the best. It is one who creates the most memorable works. That is you. The dungeon master and the writer are the same. Neither of us are teachers or editors. I've got about 100 videos in this series, and almost none of them have anything to do with the rules. Almost all of them have some incredibly memorable story in them, and those stories have almost nothing to do with the rules. The people online who share their experiences, their characters, moments, campaigns, storylines, they are joyfully sharing the drama that happened at their table. And in my experience, the more fun the story, the less anyone's talking about the rules. And almost without exception, the people I see online complaining about the strict application of the rules do not seem to me to be people who take pleasure in the joy of the game. Are they brimming with stories they have to tell about their games, or do they just hover around online waiting for someone to make a mistake? These rules pedants seem to me to be precisely the same as the grammar pedants who worry about less versus fewer or uninterested versus disinterested. These people are not primarily interested in writing or storytelling or dialogue or character or tension or pacing. They don't seem to care if the people at your table are having fun. They only seem interested in policing other people, controlling them. Well, sod them the lot. The rules are not a tyrant to be obeyed. They are a tool to help you. They work for you, not the other way around. And what are the rules for? They exist for exactly the same reason as the rules of syntax and grammar, which every writer I know ignores whenever they feel like it, and that is they exist to help you communicate, to express yourself. They allow you to be creative. They are building blocks you can ignore or take apart and put together however you see fit. Rulings, not rules, but language is under all of it. I can speak a sentence no one has ever spoken before. I do it all the time. What are you doing? I'm putting the blue flavored go juice into my smart water. Blue flavor? Blue flavor? Flavor can't be color. Well, yes it can. I just did it. You've all had Otter Pops. You know what blue flavor tastes like. Let me give you a concrete example. In the fourth edition game I've been streaming on Twitch, Anna wanted her high elf fighter to run and jump onto the back of a griffin that was 50 feet in the air and flying away with the party's warlord. That's what she wanted to do. The question was, did she have enough movement to do it? Well, she could run and gain more movement that way. She could run twice. She could jump as part of that movement. She could face step and she had an action point. She had lots of tools to get up to the back of the griffin and doing some quick math, I was pretty sure she could do it, but I didn't know exactly the proper combination of these options. So I just made a ruling. You can do it if, 
And I proposed something that required an athletics check and involved her action point, and it made sense to her. No need to look anything up. Folks in chat said, well, that's not how the rules work, but rule of cool, which I think misses the point. The rule of cool says, don't let the rules stop players from doing awesome stuff. The implication is, you know what the rule is, but you create an exception to allow the player to do something amazing. But I didn't know what the rule was. I didn't let Anna jump onto the griffin because I thought it was cool. I let her do it because I was pretty sure she could. And in fact, I inadvertently penalized her. I said she could do it if she used her action point. But after the game, I read some rules and I realized she didn't need to use her action point. Her knowledge of the rules and my knowledge of the rules were imperfect. But that is not a problem because the goal is for us to communicate and we did that very easily. The rules supplied us with lots of building blocks, like words, that we put together into something like a sentence that made sense to us and everybody else in the game. RPGs are different than board games or card games or sports. Those games are competitive and they rely on the rules for entirely different reasons. Because in those games, there is a winner and the rules tell us who won and following the rules ensures the competition is fair. But RPGs are not competitive. We have an entirely different relationship with the rules. The rules for an RPG are a language. It doesn't matter if you're using them exactly the way the designers intended or the way other people at other tables use them. What matters is that you are able to communicate with the people at your table, that you are able to create something new and unique and exciting. Folks like saying that the purpose of language is to communicate, and this is true, but one of the primary reasons we choose to communicate is to express ourselves in new and unique ways. But the folks who say that the purpose of language is to communicate usually mean that any deviation from the strict application of the rules can only cause confusion. This is not true. Everyone knows what it means to boldly go where no one has gone before. If you leave the comma out of the sentence, let's eat, Grandma, no one will think you intend to eat your grandmother. You broke a rule, but you communicated perfectly clearly. If you leave the comma out of the sentence, I'd like to thank my parents, God, and Justin Timberlake, some folks might laugh, but they won't actually think you mean that you are the offspring of God and Justin Timberlake. Communication, expression, creation are all possible, and in many cases require a healthy disregard of the rules. So don't wait to start running D&D until you have a perfect mastery of the rules. That may never happen. And there are no rewards for running a game 100% by the rules. No one comes and congratulates you. The rules aren't sitting behind the screen. You are. WotC isn't sitting behind the screen. You are. If something goes wrong, if your players don't have fun, that's on you. You can't blame the company who made the game or the people who wrote the rules. They weren't running the game. You were. This series is, I think, a, a useful tool for teaching people how to run D&D, and we almost never talk about the rules. That alone should tell you how important you, the Dungeon Master, are to the game as your players experience it, and not the rules. It's a truth table, right? I've had sessions where I never had to look up a rule and we had a lot of fun. I've had sessions where we never had to look up a rule and we did not have fun. I've had sessions where we did have to look up the rules, and we still had fun, and I've had sessions where we had to look up the rules and we did not have fun. Therefore, a perfect understanding of the rules is clearly not necessary. This is a series about being a dungeon master. It is not a series about being a game designer. As a dungeon master, I have a healthy disregard for the rules. I am primarily concerned with drama and communication, uh, which includes invention and creativity, putting the building blocks of the game together in new and novel ways to solve unique problems and keep the game flowing. As a game designer, the rules are of primary importance to me. And if I have done a good job explaining my attitude as a dungeon master, then you'll understand why the rules are so important to me as a designer. Because I am literally designing the language my customers are going to use to communicate. And when we're doing that, we cannot screw around. Kingdoms and Warfare is much more successful as a language, orders of magnitude more successful than strongholds and followers. 
I can tell that because of the ease with which people are communicating about it in our Discord. They are able to use the terminology to have complex discussions about hypothetical scenarios, and it all just happens naturally. People are able to use these rules to communicate because of how much more time we spent on the rules. A whole team of designers and an excellent cadre of testers, none of which we had on the first book. It is more successful as a rule book because it is more successful as a language. The folks in our Discord who are talking about it, they're using the rules in unique and inventive ways that are not strictly what we intended, but they are clearly the right solution for them in the moment. That is the power of language. Thanks for watching, everybody. A bit of a rant. I look forward to seeing your responses in the comments below. I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of people who disagree with something that I said in, in well thought out ways. Next video is gonna be a bit shorter and I think actually for the players, a message to the players at the table. Until then, thanks for watching. Peace out.